debugging, debugging in C Sharp. What is debugging? If you've been following along my tutorials so far, we've worked with the C Sharp language, we've done lots of different things, object orientation, loops, calculations, methods. But during these exercises, for example, and working with the language, the fact of life is that humans are human. They're going to make mistakes. And whether it's intentional or unintentional or just a total accident, these things happen. This is where debugging comes in. Now debugging is a loose term. The word debugging is used in two different senses. We can say, okay, I'm going to do some debugging. And this is the process of trying to find bugs. Maybe your software has no bugs, but you're going to try and find some just to make sure it works correctly. This is quite normal. You also might use the term debugging when your software has a problem and you're trying to locate the problem. So you would say, I'm going to try and debug my software because there's an error. I don't know where it is, but I need to try and find it. So it's used in two senses here. Now, like I mentioned, the fact of life is no one is perfect. If everyone was perfect, then software companies wouldn't even hire test teams to run tests. You wouldn't have something called unit tests. You wouldn't need to test your code. But the fact of life is we're not perfect. And this is why we need to know about debugging and to try and find errors in our software. Now, so far in this tutorial series, we've been using Visual Studio. Now, Visual Studio is great. It contains many tools, features, and we've barely scraped the surface, to be honest. It has a compiler that compiles our code. It has the IDE where we can actually type into, create projects, solutions. It has that autocomplete feature, also known as IntelliSense. So lots of different things. But one other thing it also has is what's called a debugger. So a debugger is a piece of software, a totally separate program written by Microsoft. And the job of the debugger is to attach itself to another piece of software. This is called attaching the debugger. So what software does this debugger attach itself to? Well, this is your code, your software. Every time you hit that green play button, your software compiles in the background. If you're using Windows, for example, it compiles into an EXE, for example. Then the debugger can attach itself to this EXE file in this case. But not only your software, it can attach itself to another executing process which your system is running. It's quite powerful. So what is the benefit of this debugger attaching itself to your software? What, what is the purpose of that? Why would it do that? Well, when a debugger attaches itself to your software, it allows you to exercise a level of control while your code is running. And it can examine particular segments of code when things may go wrong. So while your software is executing, imagine that you can pause your software at any point in time. Say your software loads, it's running a loop, for example, maybe a for loop. And you can just halt the execution midway through the loop. Say you have a for loop and it counts to 10. You can stop your software at a moment in time, for example, when it's just counted to four. So while the software is running, you can go into your code and inspect everything. You can see values of variables. You can even control the execution. So manually make that for loop do two more iterations, for example. And you can do this yourself. Have you ever seen those superhero movies where the guy is really fast and the whole world is frozen, but because he's so fast, he can interact with people in real time. Imagine that to be like a debugger. The world is going about its business, but this super fast entity, this super fast hero can kind of fly around at the speed of light and modify things and control things. This is kind of how a debugger works. It's, it's quite powerful and quite entertaining to use, to be honest. And the process of pausing your application while it's running using the debugger is called entering break mode. And when I said you can actually control the execution, for example, if your software is running and it's about to run a method, you can skip this method entirely by stepping over it. And controlling the flow of your software while it's running is called code stepping. So the debugger is actually quite a powerful piece of software. And 99.999% of developers would use a debugger in creating some sort of software. 
So let's take a look at an example of that now. How do we enter this world where we're a fast superhero and we can pause the software and change things around and change values of variables and skip methods and all things like that? How do we do that? Well, let's take a look. So if you've been following along our other tutorials so far, when we write some code, we've been pressing this green play button up here. When we press the green play button, our software runs. And when we want to kill it or terminate it, we either cross off the window here or press this red stop button up here. So that's what we've been doing so far. If you go to the left of this green play button here, you'll notice a drop down list here. By default, it should say debug but underneath it also has release. Now these two items here are quite important. If we have debug selected in this list, then every time we press this green play button, the debugger is also executed and it also attaches itself to our software. For those curious, if you select release in this list, then typically we use this when we want to give the software to someone else because it doesn't contain any debugging information. But for now, let's talk about debug here. Now this is called a release mode. Right now we want to debug our program. We want to find some errors and do some detective work. So typically when we develop software, as a developer and we're finding errors and developing our solution, we would use this release mode here, debug, and this is why it's default. So like I said before, when we run the application here and our software is running, in the background, the debugger, the Visual Studio debugger has attached itself to our software. And I can prove that to you. If I open Task Manager, so here's my task manager here. These are all the applications I'm running. Here's Visual Studio. But underneath here, you can see the Visual Studio Debugger console. So this is running in the background and this is actually attached to our software. But so far, we haven't really made any use of this in our previous tutorials. But in this tutorial and the next few, we're going to be using this quite a lot now. So let's take a look at the Visual Studio Debugger. So let's have a look at doing some debugging. Here I have a sample application. When this main method runs here, it's entering into a never ending while loop. So the application is never going to quit out. So every time this while loop loops, we're asking the user to enter a day of the week. We're taking their answer, storing it into a variable, then passing their answer to this method here. Depending what day of the week they enter, we have a switch statement that prints out a custom message depending what day of the week they enter. So quite simple. And every time it outputs a message, we're just entering a blank line. And then looping back again to ask them for another day of the week. So it's quite a simple application. So with this application here, I have a bit of a problem. When I type in Wednesday, it's not giving me the actual output I want. When I type in Wednesday, I want it to output Wednesdays are meh, which it doesn't currently. So for example, if I type in Tuesday, I get an answer for Tuesday, but for Wednesday, you can see it's telling me I entered an invalid day. Now I appreciate this is a very simple piece of software, but imagine this software being very complicated. You might have 50 files, you might have methods, methods calling methods, methods inside loops. So you can see it can get very complicated. So let's take a look at how we can debug an application like this. So we know so far using our detective skills that Tuesday works. So therefore the code is kind of coming into this method, the switch statement is run and we're getting an answer for Tuesday. However, Wednesday is not working. So there's a problem with this code around this point. At least that's what I would think. So it looks like when I type in Wednesday, it's outputting this kind of default section right here. So why is it doing that? So what I could do in this case is add what's called a break point. And if you come over to this left hand side here, there's a gray bar. And when I go anywhere in this gray bar, you can see a gray circle there. If I click with the left button, it adds a red dot. So you can see right here. And this is called what's setting a break point. And why is it called a break point? Well, when I run the software here and type in any day of the week, 
you can see the code execution stops. Do you remember when I explained to you what a debugger was? And I said it's like that superhero that can modify things in real time, you know, like the speed of light. This is kind of the debugger in action. Now the debugger has attached itself to our software. So by setting what's called a breakpoint, these red dots here, we can set as many as we would like. Every time the code reaches one of these red dots, the software will freeze, it will stop. Nothing more can be done. If I try to open my software, I can't interact with it at all. It's totally frozen and we have full control at code level. So this yellow piece here, this is what it's frozen on and that's our first breakpoint. So nothing else can happen, it's frozen in time. So what we can do while we're stopped here, we can actually inspect things, look. If I hover over this, I can see the value of our variable here, I can see the value of it getting passed here. So it's pretty cool, isn't it? It's like interacting with the world while the world is frozen, you know, feel, feel the power. <laughs> So this is the power of a break point. It breaks the software. And I don't mean break like break a glass cup or break a glass vase. I mean break as in pause, like halt, halt the execution. So that's what a break point is. The next thing I want to talk about is what's called code stepping. What is code stepping? So right now our software is frozen in time. It's frozen at this line right here. The switch statement hasn't been run yet, it's yellow, which means it's about to be executed, but not yet. So what we can do, we can manually execute the next line of code, and this is called stepping, and we can do this manually. So if we come up here, you see all these icons here. This one here, it says step into, this one step over, this one step out, and this one step backwards. So lo lots of different stepping buttons right here. But what what is stepping? Well, for example, this one here, step over. You see the key keyboard shortcut here is F10. So if I press F10, that's going to step over this statement. And what that means is the code is going to execute to the next line of code or the next block of code. So inside a switch statement here, it's taking in our input, which is pretty much a garbled string. So what should happen is this line of code would be run because we don't have any day of the week matching our input. So if I press F10, which is step over, you can see the code then goes to this line right here. So now we've executed the start of the switch statement and now the software again is frozen in time on this line. You can see we don't have a breakpoint on this line, but that doesn't matter because we manually stepped over. If we want the software to continue executing, then we would press the play button, for example, then the software would just keep running until it hits one of these red breakpoints. But when we do code stepping, like step over, step into, all that kind of stuff, we're manually executing a line of code at a time or a block of code at a time, like a switch statement, for example. So that's the power of stepping, and that's just manually running segments of your code in sequence, how it would normally be executed. So now the software is frozen on this line here. You entered an invalid day. If I press F10 again, then now our console window will display this line. So if I open the console window, you can see this line has now been executed. But again, the software is frozen in time again on this break symbol here. So I press F10 again. And now we're about to write this line to the console, F10 again. And now the method is executed. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? So stepping in Visual Studio when working in C Sharp is to manually control the code. So manually execute pieces of code. So that's what code stepping is. It allows us to manually execute lines of code and we can do this ourselves and we can do this by setting breakpoints to initially halt the code. And then we can use what's called step commands to step into, over, out and all things like that. 
But what is the difference between step into, step out, step over? What, what are these things? Well, consider this example here. We've run the application and I'm calling this method five times in a row for no real reason other than to show you the difference. If we run step into, which is F11, then we're going to step into this method. So if I hit F11, you can see the next line of code to be run is the open curly brace right here, followed by the switch statement. So I've stepped into a method. So I've stepped in here. What we can also do is step over the method. So just ignore all this completely. Maybe we know this method is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. So we can step over this entire method. And then the next line to be run will be this one here because we've stepped over the whole method. So that's the difference between step into and step over. We can kind of just skip a whole section of code. And you may, you may have guessed it, what is step out? Well, we're in a method right now. I can click step out, shift F11, and we can completely step out of the method. And we do that when we assume the rest of the method's fine. We kind of want to step out of here and get back where we were before and then step into anything else. So that's the difference between these step commands. Typically, it's just step into a something like a method or a class or something like that or a property, or we could step over it completely. So just ignore it and carry on with the rest. And if we find ourselves in a method and you know everything looks kind of good, then we can step out of it. So these are called step commands and the process of moving the code's execution is called code stepping or stepping. So that's the difference with those there. So now I've explained breakpoints, code stepping, stepping commands. Let's try and find our problem here. It may look quite obvious, but remember we said Wednesday wasn't outputting the correct message. So why is that? So let's set a breakpoint on this switch statement here because we know the problem is likely to be inside this switch statement. So I'm going to run the application now and I'm going to type Wednesday. I'm going to hit enter and we're about to launch this switch statement. So here's our variable here. I can hover over input and I can see, look, Wednesday. So now what's happening is if I step over here, you can see it's hitting this default case. So none of these cases are matching Wednesday. But which seems weird because I have Wednesday right here, right? No, Wednesday. So if I hover over this variable, Wednesday. Oh, I see, look, the Y is in a capital right there. It's uppercase. So that's probably why. <laughs> so now I've changed this Y to lowercase. I hover over this variable here. It looks like it matches correctly. So this should work now. So what I could do is restart the application. You see this icon here next to the stop button. It says restart. What I could also do is stop the program or cross it off and then run it again. This restart button here, what that does, it restarts our code, but it leaves the debugger running in the background. So if you click restart, especially if you have a large piece of software, it's slightly quicker to get going again. So that's the difference between the restart and the stop play button. One thing we can also do, for example, is to manually move the code's execution. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> So right now we're executing this line of code. It's just about to be run. So we just step over that. And now we're about to execute this line here. So essentially this switch statement here is finished executing. What we can do is hover our mouse over this yellow arrow right here, hold in our left button, and we can actually move the code's execution right back to the start of the switch statement, like it was never run in the first place. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> so imagine dragging the mouse here as using a step command, like step over or into, but it allows you to step back, but not only one line, but multiple lines. So it's a shortcut for those step commands, but it allows you to do it in big chunks, for example. So now we're about to rerun the switch statement again, but we've actually modified the code here and we haven't even stopped our software. So it's done in real time. So it's pretty cool, isn't it? 
So now if I step over using F10, you can see this line is now hit. So right line, Wednesdays are meh. So it looks like we've fixed the problem. Look, we've, it, was just, uh, it was just that uppercase Y on Wednesday. So now what I can do is just press F5, which is short for this green play button. So now I think the problem's solved. I don't want to do any more debugging. I can take away my breakpoints if I want. And then I can just hit this green play button. And that will just let the software continue as normal. So now it's saying Wednesdays are meh, which is perfect. That's exactly what I want. So if I repeat it again, we get exactly the same result. So it looks like we fixed the issue with our software. It was just a one character difference. And it might be a minor change, but even things like a one character difference can bring, say, SpaceX rockets down to the floor, you know, never reaching orbit. So it is very important that everything is checked in pure detail. And in order to do that, a debugger is a very useful tool on how to accomplish things like that. So I'm going to introduce one more example and a couple of other debugging tools you may find useful. And they are run to click and run to cursor. So let's take a look at this example here. If you followed along the previous tutorials, then you probably remember this example. So essentially this example, the user asks for, is, is being asked for a number. You type in number 25 and then it draws a pyramid which is 25 lines high. For example, because I put 25, it has 25 lines high. But you can see there's a problem with the background for this pyramid. This right side here is going on too long. It should look like the left side here. So after each line, you can see the pyramid grows wider, but the background kind of shrinks just like this. But this behavior isn't being mimicked on the right hand side. So there's a bit of a problem with this. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So here's the example here. We're asking the user for how high they want the pyramid to be. We're passing it into a method. So we're delegating all the kind of logic of drawing the pyramid in this one method here. We have our main for loop that draws out each line of the pyramid in turn. And then we have three for loops. One to do the hyphens on the left, one to draw the pyramid, and one to do the hyphens on the right. We know we have a problem with the hyphens on the right, so this is probably a good area to kind of set our breakpoint and have a look what's going on here. So if we run the software, we ask the user for a number. Let's start out with a low number. Low numbers are easier to debug because there's not many of them. So I'll type in the number five. So our breakpoint has been hit here. And right now, uh, H isn't declared. So let's press F10 to step over. And now we've initialized the kind of header for our for loop. So right now, we're about to do the first iteration of the loop. So H is 1 because that's its initial value here. And then H is going to keep running until it's less than or equal to what looks like 5. And every iteration we increase by 1. So for the first line, H is going to continue 5 times because that's the size right here. So if I step over that, we're outputting one hyphen, and then two hyphens, three, four, five, and then it's done. So the very first line on a pyramid, which is five units high, outputs five hyphens on the right. Is, is that true? Is that right? No, because on the first line, it should output four. So it's generating too many hyphens here. So why is this? It's obviously generating too many hyphens, but the hyphens on the left are generating the correct amount. So you can see here, the hyphen should stop when it's size minus y. That's the formula we had in here. So we've obviously done it for this hyphen loop here, but we've neglected to replicate the same functionality for, for the hyphens on the right. So by using a breakpoint, you can see that we can examine the value of h while the software is running. Let's just do that now. So you can see we can examine the values of h, we can examine the values of size, we can examine the values of y, we can even examine values up here, 
values coming into the method and using the step commands like step over or into, we can actually control the execution of the software. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? So let's say we've figured out the solution here, we've figured out the problem. Now I mentioned a couple things before about run to cursor and run to click. What are they? Well, run to cursor and run to click are kind of shortcut commands. Remember when I talked about dragging this yellow arrow here, right up here, so we can kind of control the execution manually? Run to click and run to cursor are kind of shortcuts for controlling the code flow, like code stepping. So if I put my cursor here, for example, right click, and then I choose run to cursor. Click that, and then the execution goes to wherever my mouse cursor was. So it's a bit of a shortcut, and it's quite useful. Another one is run to click. You can see when I, every time I click a new line, this mysterious little green play button appears. So you can see here, this one right here. I click this line, it appears right here. It's like a bit of a, a green ghost. <laughs> so this is called run to click. If I click this little green play button here, the code execution is going to jump to this line. So it's pretty much the same thing as clicking this line, right clicking and choosing run to cursor. So it's just a nice little handy shortcut. So you can see run to click and run to cursor are both handy little shortcuts. And if this section of code repeats multiple times, then I can click this for example and the code execution will then keep going until it reaches this line. So they're just nice little code stepping shortcuts. So this one is run to click and the right click one, you can do run to cursor. But there is a shortcut for that as well, which is control F10. And the more you use Visual Studio, the more you're going to learn these shortcuts. But every developer I know anyway, will know step into and step out, which is F10 and 11. And those two are really useful for stepping through code. So now we're going to run the application and it looks like our issue with the hyphens has been resolved. It was just a problem with that last for loop here, and that's the upper bound. So when debugging code, in general, you have to ask yourself a few questions. If an error occurred, what was the statement or expression the program was doing at the time of the error? What line of code did your program fail at? Did the program fail and you had that kind of highlighted line that said there was an error there? What line was it? And when your program failed, what were the values of the variables, like the parameters, the local fields, any objects? What were those values when the error occurred? What were the sequence of statements executed at the time of the error? Were you inside a method of a method, for example? So where were you? What was executed beforehand? And I think I've pretty much covered this one. What was the result of the line of code where it failed? Or maybe the result of the line of code before the error? So you have to consider all of these things. You can't just put breakpoints anywhere and hope to find an error. You have to kind of ask yourself these questions, kind of target the error, roughly where it might be, what class it might be in, what method it could be in. Then once you've kind of isolated it to a particular method, then you can start kind of plotting breakpoints and kind of isolate it a bit. So to summarize, this is what debugging is. It's the process of looking for errors, but if you have an error, it's the process of kind of isolating the error. This is what a debugger is. So this is a Visual Studio debugger, and you can use this when you set your release mode to debug. And when you are debugging, you can place things like breakpoints, and this is where the code execution will halt. And when the code execution halts, this is called break mode. You're entering break mode, and this is when a break point has been hit. And to control the flow of execution using step into, step out, run to click, run to cursor, or even dragging the mouse along this breakpoint bar, then this is called code stepping. So these are all the kind of terms and all the terminology to do with debugging in Visual Studio. And you may be surprised, but we've only scraped the surface of debugging. So I hope this tutorial helped you, and thank you for watching.